Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes tonight. My name's Tim. I'm just going to be moderating until Brahms ready. I'd like to welcome all of you tonight for our latest presentation by David Ramsey Steele and All About Marx. Now, I'm going to introduce our uh, moderator, Ron Brassford. Thank you, Ted. All right, and our speaker tonight is an author. Did you bring a supply of your literature? Oh, oh dear. And, and, but he did bring his lovely daughter, who's sitting over there, uh, Emma. So, uh, and uh, somebody here is going to cheer loudly. Uh, right. Anyhow, uh, welcome our speaker. Our speaker. Fellow members of the human species, anybody else who may be paying attention, my topic is good and bad in Karl Marx. <clears throat> it's a bit unusual. Uh, most, when, mostly when I give a talk, it's something I've been thinking about for the past six months. Um, occasionally it's something I was thinking about five or ten years ago and then I've come back to it. But this is something I was thinking about approximately between the years 1965 and 1975. So, if ever you've woken up at night in a cold sweat and thought, what was that guy still thinking about between 1965 and 1975? Uh, this is the talk for you. If you are not that kind of a person who has never asked that question, then I don't know what you're doing here. You might as well go home. Um, but I see you're not leaving. Um, <clears throat> so in the 1960s, I was a Marxist. Um, I think I definitively became a non-Marxist by 1971, but there were a few loose ends I had to tie up. So everything I'm going to tell you is things I was thinking about between 1965 and 1975. Actually, the decisive year was 1971, and um, I was at that time living in a, a city in the northeast of England called Hull. And it seems to me that whenever I went in that, in that year, there was a, a rock music uh, track playing called Backstreet Love by Third Air, Curved Air. I don't think it was a hit over here, I think it was only a hit in Britain. And that made me think of that, and I listened to it again today. Listen to it, Backstreet Love by Curved Air Band. Um, <clears throat> but that's nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Um, Karl Marx uh, was um, a very prolific writer. He wrote a great amount of material and uh, on a great many subjects. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to simplify things. When Marx died in 1883 uh, and his funeral occurred in London shortly after, <clears throat> his lifelong friend and collaborator, sorry, uh, Frederick Engels, okay, no gave the funeral uh, speech at Marx's graveside. Uh -huh. And he said that Marx, Marx had two great achievements as a thinker. First was the theory of surplus value. And second was the materialist conception of history. And he ended his speech by saying that Marx was above all a revolutionary. So my, what I'm going to say about Marx is on those three topics. Theory of surplus value, materials conception of history, and revolution. So, first of all, I'm going to tell you a few little facts about Marx. Then I'm going to talk about the theory of surplus value and tell you what might be wrong with it. Then I'm going to talk about the materialist conception of history and tell you what might be wrong with it. And then I'm going to talk about Marx's conception of revolution and what might be wrong with that. So, <clears throat> Marx was born uh, in Trier, T-R-I-E-R, -E a little town in uh, the Rhineland in Germany, in 1818. Um, Trier is, uh, its biggest claim to fame is that it's the oldest town in Germany. Uh, it was is a, a city going back to Roman times. Um, <clears throat> it's just across the Rhine from... Uh, Luxembourg, the little tiny principality of Luxembourg. Uh, and it was at that time part of the Kingdom of Prussia, 
uh, Germany had not yet been unified, but the biggest state in the German-speaking world was, uh, was the Kingdom of Prussia. And it included um, the Rhineland, although it's not a very Prussian part of Germany. So <clears throat> Marx was born there. Um, he, he comes on both sides of his family, that's to say his father and his mother's father, from a long line of rabbis. But his father had converted to Lutheranism and um, changed his first name from Herschel to Heinrich. Um, so Karl Marx was raised as a typical Lutheran um, and was not particularly uh, imbued with Judaism and he had the same attitude to Jews that most Lutherans had in Germany at that time. Um, <clears throat> he was quite intelligent, quite gifted. Uh, the, his family was fairly well off, middle class family. Uh, and he, Marx became a student. His father wanted him to become a lawyer and wanted him to focus entirely on law, but that wasn't at all to Karl Marx's taste. He wanted to do philosophy. And he, um, when he went to university, he drank a lot. He always drank a lot throughout his life. Um, and um, he fell in with a bad crowd, you might say, of revolutionaries, people who are very critical of, of the established society. Now, I have to explain something, I suppose, for those of you who went to a Chicago public school and therefore don't know the basic elements of history, um, that um, Europe at that time was mostly... Um, not democratic and not and didn't have much in the way of civil liberties. So in most parts of Europe, if you were involved, if you were involved with any revolutionary grouping or even any liberal reform grouping, you were likely to be watched by the police. Your mail would be opened. Um, <clears throat> anything you wrote would be examined by the official government censor, and if they found something objectionable in it, they could just suppress the entire print run of that book. And that was quite typical in most of Europe at that time. Certainly, it's typical of Prussia, Russia, France, and many other parts of Europe. Um, <clears throat> so, Marx, as a student, uh, attracted the attention of the authorities, and um, he began to be watched. Um, <clears throat> now, in 1842, uh, a German writer called Lorenz von Stein published a book called The Socialism and Communism of Present-Day France. Uh, and this is like telling German intellectuals the latest thing that's going on. Uh, and although it's going on in, in Paris, it's actually Germans who are mostly doing it because there's a large German emigre community in Paris at that time, and that's where a lot of these socialist and communist ideas were coming from. So. <clears throat> There is a dispute among scholars about how important this particular book was on Marx, but it's, it's symptomatic of a general current of opinion, whereby a number of German intellectuals were picking up on these new ideas of socialism and communism. And Marx picked up on the idea from von Stein or from somewhere else that communism was the way of the future. Communism was a working class, a proletarian, system of thought, whereas socialism was a middle class system of thought. Um, and throughout most of his life, although we now tend to think of the term, the term socialism and communism have changed their meaning several times in very different ways. Um, <clears throat> Marx called himself a communist and was clear that he was not a socialist but a communist. For example, when he had an argument with Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, the French socialist, both Proudhon and Marx were clear that Proudhon was a socialist and not a communist. Marx was a communist and not a socialist. That was the terminology of the time. Also in the early 1840s, uh, Marx made the acquaintance of uh, Friedrich Engels, who went to, uh, later went to England, uh, and so he, he he morphed from Friedrich Engels into Frederick Engels, um, and um, they were lifelong collaborators after that. They rarely disagreed. Uh, they saw eye to eye on a great many topics. Uh, and it soon became apparent that Engels acknowledged that Marx 
was a bigger intellect than he was. Marx acknowledged that as well. <laughs> but, uh, um, so Engels was financially better situated. Okay, Engels was quite well fixed. Uh, Marx was not so well fixed, and Engels had to help him out from time to time. Uh, and he helped him out on the understanding that Marx was a deep thinker who was going to do more for the development of these ideas than he could do, or than anybody else he could see uh, in Europe at the time could do. In 1848, uh, these two men, uh, Marx and Engels, uh, published uh, a work with momentous implications, and that was the Manifesto of the Communist Party, usually called the Communist Manifesto. Um, <coughs> there was actually no Communist Party at that time anywhere, but there was a little group called the Communist League, uh, of which a number of people who were to have significant effect on subsequent history got to know each other. Uh, one of them was Ferdinand Lassala, founder of the German working class socialist movement. Um, another was Marx, another was Engels. Uh, so Marx and Engels wrote this book, The Manifesto of the Communist Party, and it's a very famous book. Everybody's read it unless they went to a Chicago public school. Um, and um, it certainly is uh, one of the great political pamphlets of all time. It's brilliantly written. Uh, it's full of memorable phrases. Um, it opens, Ein Gespenst geht um in Europa, das Gespenst des Kommunismus. A spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of communism. It talks about the cash nexus, it talks about the idiocy of rural life, and, and there are all these resonant phrases that we all know from the Communist Manifesto. And it concludes, uh, workers of all lands unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains, you have a world to win. So, <clears throat> the Communist Manifesto originally was anonymous, and a lot of people read it who didn't know who had written it. Um, uh, and it had, had some influence on a small minority of intellectuals, but these were people who did things and wrote things all over Europe. Um, in 1849, Marx was expelled from Paris, where he, from France, where he'd been living. Uh, he had to leave France uh, because the authorities didn't want this Prussian on their territory. Uh, so there was an expulsion order from the highest level of the government to get rid of Marx. So he had to leave, and he went to London at the end of 1849. Uh, he didn't know it then, but he was going to stay in London uh, for the rest of his life. Actually, a, he died in Algiers, where he was on a brief trip for his health. But uh, basically, his, resident, his domicile was London from the end of 1849 to, until his death in 1883. Um, <clears throat> He had, be he had formed the a number of convictions at this point. First of all, that capitalist society had to give way to communist society. And that's something we'll get into what that means a bit later. Secondly, that this, this revolution, this replacement of capital capitalist society by communist society was going to be done by the new working class, the wage workers the unattached proletariat. Uh, Marx always, you always often use the term proletariat, and proletariat is a term that goes back to ancient Rome, and it means people who own nothing except their children. That's the meaning of the term proletariat. Um, and it, it's rather, it, it always strikes me that if you want to talk to the working class, you don't use words like proletariat, at least not to begin with. Um, but um, so, Working class is a, is a reasonable kind of um, translation. But uh, Marx often said proletariat, and the, uh, the opponents of the, of the proletariat, the oppressing class, were the bourgeoisie, or the capitalists. Now Marx had decided that the future lay with the proletariat, who would bring in communism. Of course, then they would cease to exist, there would be no proletariat. Uh, and he had therefore decided that the most important subject to study was economics, or as it was then called, political economy. 
There came a point in history later where the term political economy was replaced by the term economics, but it means the same thing, studied exactly the same subject material. Um, and of course the great home of political economy, economics, was England. Uh, because that's where 90% of anything that was interesting in economics had been written at that time. Uh, Adam Smith is an obvious example. In 1776, wrote The Wealth of Nations. David Ricardo, who wrote his Principles of Political Economy and Taxation in, I think, 1824 or thereabouts. Um, he was the other great name. Um, but there were numerous other writers on political economy. Uh, and there was also some French and German writers on political economy. <coughs> so Marx formed the following plan. He would go to the reading room of the British Museum. Now in London, there was this place called the British Museum, and it had a reading room. But, and this is a slightly misleading, because what it was was in fact the world's biggest library. And it, they changed the name quite recently, I, I don't know, in the 1970s or something, to the British Library, but it used to be called the Reading Room of the British Museum. And it was at that time the biggest library in the world. It had basically anything that had ever been published in the European language. And Marx set himself the plan to write about political economy and to learn about political economy, so he would go around to the, British, the Reading Room of the British Museum every day, and he would read and make notes on what he read, and he became very knowledgeable about political economy. Um, I would say there is no question that Karl Marx by the 1870s was by far the most knowledgeable person in the world on the history of economic thought, either at that time or at any previous time. He knew everything by the 1870s that had ever been written by anybody on the subject of political economy. Um, and this was because he spent all these hours in the British Museum reading this stuff. Um, and one thing I would say about Marx is, when you, when you read a few things about Marx, you think, well, he, he got drunk. <laughs> and um, he did all kinds of other things that are slightly disreputable. Uh, there is, you know, there is one anecdote where he got together with a couple of his uh, German emigre buddies, and they w went down this street in London, smashing every every uh, public light lamp. Um, <laughs> they both have a, had a few pints. Um, now, I've done worse things than that, but I did them when I was in my teens or early 20s, and Marx was doing this sort of thing when he was in his 40s and 50s. Uh, so, it's not quite the same, I don't think. But anyway, uh, so people read this sort of stuff and they form a certain image. And one thing, so one thing you should bear in mind about Marx uh, is that he was tremendously industri industrious. He was a workhorse. Uh, he was constant, hour after hour in the British Museum writing notes on these books he was reading. Um, so that's a few things about Marx. Um, he wrote several books that weren't published, and he wrote several books that were published. By the way, he was trying to support himself, he chose to support himself by writing journalism. And he wrote uh, short articles for newspapers. Um, the biggest outlet for his articles was the New York Daily Tribune. Uh, it was the biggest circulation newspaper in the United States at that time. Um, when he started doing this in 1850, he wrote the articles in German, and Engels translated them and sent them across uh, <coughs> to New York. Um, but after a couple of years, Marx was able to write them in English. Marx. Uh, never achieved a conversational competence in English. He never was able to chat informally with English people in London. Uh, he chatted informally with his German emigres who were always passing through, or some of whom were living there. Um, but, he, but formal English, he could write a speech and deliver it in English, and it would be fine, it would be grammatically perfect, like his speech, uh, Value, Price and Profit. Um, 
But of course, nearly everything he wrote that was really important was written in German, or occasionally in French. Uh, you know, his, his counter, his counter position to uh, Proudhon. Proudhon wrote a book called um, La Philosophie de la Misère, which means the philosophy of wretchedness, or philosophy of poverty is the usual translation. And Marx repasted with a book called La Misère de la Philosophie, uh, The Poverty of Philosophy. Uh, so he wrote that in French. Uh, and uh, he was able to write uh, fluently in French and German, and with a little bit of hard work and difficulty in English, but he, most of what he wrote that's important was in German. Um, <clears throat> In 1859, he wrote a book, Zur sort of Kritik. Uh, it's toward the critique of political economy. Uh, but at that time, in the English language, it wasn't customary to begin to have titles that began to word. So it was translated as a contribution to the critique um, of political economy. Uh, and that was fairly well received. Um, and after that, Marx formed the following great plan, and this was the great plan that dominated his life from then on. He was going to write uh, an immense four-volume work, which was going to be called Capital, or in German, Das Kapital. Um, and it was going to be a total critique of political economy. Uh, and I have to explain here, um, heavy going for the people who went to Chicago Public School, but I have to explain here that um, the word critique has shifted in its meaning. In the, in the 19th century, critique didn't mean any kind of derogatory uh, broadside or, or criticism. Critique meant to analyze a system of thought thoroughly, expose its inner contradictions, reconstitute this system of thought on a higher level. That's what critique was. Um, the, most, the most famous critique, of course, is Immanuel Kant's critique, Der Reine Vernunft, critique of pure reason. And um, then there, were the, uh, there was the other critique of Immanuel Kant and the critiques of, of Hegel. And it was in that tradition, when Marx set out to write a critique of political economy, um, <clears throat> it didn't mean that he was rejecting all of political economy. Uh, it meant that he was going to thoroughly analyze uh, the whole of political economy re uh, exposes inner contradictions, reconstituted on a higher level. That's what critique meant. Um, <clears throat> so, that's what the plan he set himself out to do. Uh, the fourth volume, the fourth and final volume of this projected work was going to be an, uh, an analysis of all previous economic thought in the light of the new analysis he had presented in the first three volumes. That was his plan. So there were going to be three volumes of economic theory, followed by a fourth volume which would deal with previous economic thinkers in light of the theory he had presented. Now, what actually happened was that only volume one ever appeared in finished form. Um, it appeared in 1867, volume one of Capital. Um, the other three volumes, volumes two and three of Capital, and volume four is usually known as theories of surplus value, but it was intended to be volume four of Capital. Uh, they appeared much later. And that accounts for quite a bit in the history of Marxism. You have to understand that this, this volume one appeared in 1867, and nothing else appeared in Marx's life. Nothing. Um, and, um, the understanding was that Engels was sending Marx money. Now, you have to understand that when Marx first settled in London, Engels wasn't, hadn't yet come into his inheritance. Engels' father had a, a part interest in a textile factory in Lancashire, in Salford, near Manchester. Um, and uh, as the son of a big manufacturing capitalist, Engels had a bit of money to play with, and occasionally he would send Marx some money. But when Engels' his father died, Engels took over his half interest in the factory. There was another partner. The other partner was an, an Englishman. I, I always think of him as a typical Lancashire capitalist. Uh, I don't know what he was really like. I imagine he might say things like, where there's muck, there's brass. And, um, 
there's an ounce of queer as fork, because um, that's the sort of thing that people from Lancashire say. Um, uh, but anyway, um, Engels came into his inheritance, and then he settled a regular income on Marx. So Marx was very poverty stricken for some years, but then when Engels came into his inheritance and started sending him regular money, he was quite comfortable. Uh, and he didn't have to do this writing for the New York Daily Tribune anymore or any of these other newspapers that he'd been writing for. He could just concentrate entirely on his, um, on his scholarly work. Um, now, what actually happened was that Marx worked very solidly for some years on these uh, remaining three volumes of Capital. Uh, but then, towards the end of his life, he stopped. And he didn't tell Engels he'd stopped. But when Engels, after his death, came to look at what he'd done, Engels figured out that Marx had done nothing for several years. And there's a question about why that is. Uh, why did Marx stop work? Uh, after all, he'd done a good job with the first volume of Capital. The first volume of Capital is a, is a masterpiece. It's worth reading. Well, it's, more, it's worth reading more than once. Um, uh, it's an amazing synthesis of material. Um, and it has a great... Uh, central thrust, which is well argued. Uh, it's very polished, there's lots of, shows his great knowledge of the history of political economy, his great knowledge of conditions in English factories, constantly quoting from the reports of the English factory, factory inspectors, and a great general scholarly knowledge. Um, this, this was a man who read through Aeschylus in the original Greek every year. This was a man who taught himself Spanish in a month, which is not too difficult to do if you already know Latin, Italian, and French, uh, taught himself Spanish within a month in order to read Don Quixote. Um, so it's a brilliant mind, and it's on display in Volume 1 of Capital. Um, but Volumes 2, 3, and 4 never appeared in finished form, and that's entirely Marx's doing. He could have finished them. Uh, and so the question is why? <coughs> I would suggest a conjecture. There's no way of testing this conclusively. I would suggest that in the 1870s, um, independently of Marx, nothing to do with Marx, there was a revolution in economic thinking, a scientific revolution. We call it the marginal revolution. Uh, the three, three people are normally um, credited with this, independent, working independently. They came up with theory, theories that have a great similarity in some respects. William Stanley Jevons in England, Karl Menger in Vienna, and the greatest of them, um, Leon Varas in France, uh, they came up with this new approach to economics, which actually completely cuts the ground under the foundations of Marxist theory. And I won't bother to get, what, spend time now, but we can discuss this later if anybody wants me to explain this a bit at greater length. Okay, so um, moving on now to surplus value. Uh, in volume one of Capital, uh, Marx puts forward his theory of surplus value. And, According to Marx and his followers at the time, this was a great breakthrough in human thinking. Now, Marx had always believed, since he got interested in the area in the early 1840s, uh, that capitalists exploit workers. Uh, and I, perhaps I should issue a warning here. Nobody would dispute that capitalists can sometimes exploit workers, that that can sometimes happen. But the question is whether there is something inherent in the relationship between a capitalist and a wage worker, which always or typically or normally leads to exploitation. And Marx thought there was. Marx thought that there was something quite normal and typical in the exploitation of the worker by the capitalist. <coughs> what he does in capital, his reasoning goes like this. Oh, what, I, should, I should explain this. Uh, this, is a very, this is a very important point that... Um, people often go astray. Um, many economists, not just Marx, many economists adopt the practice of developing a theory that applies to a simplified model of reality. 
And then after they've developed it and seen what happens from that model, they then add complications to take it closer to reality. So that's, this is a common device of, of economists. And it's a device that Marx adopted. So <clears throat> volumes one and two of capital, now we, by the way, we do have volumes two, three, and four of capital, but they're reconstructed from notes after Marx's death, some considerable years after Marx's death. But we do have them. So we know the general outline and the general drift. Um, <clears throat> volumes one and two of capital develop a model of capitalism that is not meant to be fully realistic. And in fact, in, at the beginning of volume three of Capital, uh, Marx says, now in this volume, we can begin to approach phenomena as they appear in the real world. So this is Marx's deliberate plan. It wasn't something he thought of after he got somewhere along. It was his plan from the beginning. So. <clears throat> You have to have, bear that in mind, that in volumes one and two of Capital, Marx is talking about an imaginary world, a simplified model world, uh, where certain things are going to be true of this world, but certain things are, are not expected to be true of this world. And later on, he's going to put in the complications and the adjustments to take it in the direction of the real world. Okay, so... <clears throat> Marx often uses the term which is translated commodity. The, the German word that, it, that is used is Ware, W-A-R-E, which is spelled the same as our word where, which is now an obsolete word in English, but it still survives in contexts like warehouse or hardware. Uh, and where, aware, or wares, are things intended to be sold. That's the definition of a where. So, <coughs> Marx's view is, so the, the usual English translation is commodity. So Marx's view is this, in a very, to give a very broad sweep. Capitalism is the system. There's a succession of systems in human history. Capitalism is the system which most develops commodity production. In other words, it most develops production for sale. But it is the system which is going to lead to the abolition of production for sale because communism is going to be a society where there's going to be no sale, no buying and selling, no money, no banks, no stock exchange. That's Marx's idea of communism. All that stuff is going to be got rid of. There's going to be no money and no prices in communism. That's something Marx is very clear about. Now, okay, so we come back to this, the opening of uh, volume one of Capital. So what Marx says is this. We observe that things exchange equal for equal. We see that this much of that exchanges for that much of this stuff over here. Um, if two things e exchange, two quantities of different things exchange, that must mean that there is something equal in these two things. Uh, they must have something in common, or they wouldn't exchange equal for equal. So Marx's argument is what's equal is the amount of labor that it took to produce them. And labor is measured in by the clock. It's measured in hours, hours of labor. So if we observe a ton of iron exchanging for 10 tons of coal, that means that it took the same amount of hours of labor to produce the ton of iron as the 10 tons of coal. This is what Marx is saying. So, and remember, this is in this abstract volume one, which is not intended to be realistic. So, if that's true, if it's true that things exchange equal for equal, how do we account for the fact that people who don't contribute any labor are able to draw value out of the system? A capitalist employs a worker, pays the worker, the capitalist sells the goods that the worker has produced, but the amount received by the capitalist is greater than the amount paid to the worker. Now, we have to take into account the other costs of the capitalist, like raw materials, uh, rent of the factory, um, machinery, and that sort of thing. But for certain purposes, we can ignore that and just look at the wages the capitalist is paying to the worker and the, the sold goods. There's a difference, and the difference is pocketed by the capitalist. And this difference, Marx calls surplus value. 
And the origin of this surplus value, Marx says, is in unpaid labor. That the worker is not paid. Now, you see, what Marx wants is a system where the, where the worker is paid everything he's fully entitled to. He's not cheated. Uh, so what Marx says is he introduces a distinction, which he thinks is a very important distinction. And the distinction is between labor and labor power. And labor power is capacity to work. Labor is work actually expended. And what Marx argues is the worker is not paid for his labor. I'm, when I say his, I mean her. Okay? Um, although, of course, most capitalists are female and most workers are male. But we'll leave that aside uh, for the time being. Um, uh, when the capitalist pays the worker, uh, the capitalist is paying the full value of what the worker is selling, which in Marx's opinion is labor power, the capacity to labor. But because labor power produces more than it took to produce itself, in other words, because the output of the worker is greater than the worker's subsistence, the difference is pocketed by the capitalist, and that becomes surplus value. Now, I'm simplifying a bit here, because surplus value, according to Marx, is also the source of interest and rent, and any other so-called unearned income, any other property income. But we're, we're just having to co cover a lot of ground here, so I'm assuming it's just the capitalist and the worker. So that's Marx's um, great breakthrough. That, and, and uh, Marx, uh, this is, um, Marx's view of how the worker is exploited. is exploited by the capitalist paying him less than the value of what he produces, but as much as the value of what he's worth, which is his labor power. Now, <clears throat> there are certain problems with this theory, and this has been pointed out many times, and I'll just touch very briefly on some of these problems. First of all, the whole idea that the source of value is labor and labor alone runs into difficulties because there are th certain things where no labor has been expended, uh, where they sell and apparently have a value. So, for example, land that has never been cultivated, never touched, forest land up, uh, on, beyond the frontier, can be bought and sold. Uh, and so M Marx's response to that is that this land doesn't have a value, but it has an what well, he calls an imaginary price. And Marx is quite witty, and he said, um, virgin land, like a woman's honor, has a price, but no value. Um, so if you, if you went to a Chicago public school, you're not laughing, but, um, <clears throat> but you will in five minutes. Um, so, <clears throat> so there are these things where it's obvious that the price is unrelated to the amount of labor that it took. Uh, like the Mona Lisa, if it, was a, if it was free on the market, would probably sell for a billion dollars. Well, it didn't take Leonardo uh, that many hours, <coughs> uh, or um, even a thousand hours, to produce the Mona Lisa. So there are these kinds of, and, that, and this is not a trivial point, because it runs through everything. I mean, if this house with a lake view or an ocean view is worth more than that house that doesn't have quite the same uh, view, even though the house with the great view took the same number of hours of labor to, to produce. So there are these things, it runs through everything, uh, non-labor sources of value. Um, so Marx's response to this is that this is the early stages of the analysis, and he's, it's his artificial model, and he's going to deal with that sort of thing later. Uh, in volume three, which unfortunately he never completed. Um, but a, a, a kind of stopgap answer can be, well, we've got a theory. There may be a few exceptions to the theory, but what theory doesn't have exceptions? Uh, and uh, our theory applies to all goods that can be made in factories. Even if it doesn't apply to some other things that can't be made in factories, it applies to all these things. And these are the typical things we're concerned with. So that seems like a good enough answer. Although, what it does mean is if someone comes up with a theory that explains how, explains the valuation of the goods that are made in factories and explains these other ones, as the theory developed by Jevons, Menger, and Barras does, uh, then the labor value theory doesn't look so good. Now, another um, 
point about this uh, labor theory of value is um, some workers may produce something in so many hours, whereas a different group of workers may produce the same thing in a different number of hours. And yet, the two objects are obviously going to have the same price in the market. They're not going to have different prices. So that's, a, some would say, a problem for the theory. Um, and Marx addresses this. He's aware of this going into it. It's not something he thought of after he'd started. Oh, well, how am I going to answer that? He thought he had an answer in advance. Um, <coughs> So basically, he came up with the idea of social necessity. What counts is not any labor, but only socially necessary labor. This is what it says. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means two things. Um, first of all, it means that only labor of average competence counts. If someone is incompetent and takes a long time to do something, it doesn't make it more valuable. That, that output is measured in value according to the average output of an, of an hour of labor, let's say. So that's his answer. But there's more to it than that, because what happens, as sometimes happens at the onset of a slump, uh, where far too much of some particular type of commodity is produced, too many shirts are produced, <coughs> suddenly the market doesn't want to buy up all those shirts. The value of those shirts really drops. Well, what Marx says there is this is another aspect of social necessity. It's not just that each item should be made according to average conditions. It's also the question of whether the market will, as he put it, stomach the output. Now, this is a, this is a, a little bit worrying about Marx's theory because what it means is that socially necessary labor is actually defined in terms of the results of the market. So there's something, there's a problem here for Marx, I think. Um, another thing we might bear in mind is there are different grades of labor. The labor of a dentist is not, isn't valued at the same as the labor of a computer programmer. The labor of uh, Tom Cruise uh, is not valued the same as the labor of the uh, out-of-work actor who's looking for a, uh, a work-on job in a movie. Um, uh, but how do you explain these differences in the value of different kinds of labor? Um, well, Marx says here that this is taken care of by the forces of competition. In practice, these different types of labor are equated. This, again, I think is a little bit unsatisfactory because it's when you're in a fix, you appeal to the data of the market, and your theory is supposed to be explaining the data of the market. So it's a problem, I think. Um, more fundamentally, I think there's a much more fundamental problem with Marx's uh, theory of surplus value. Remember, the capitalist pays the worker, the worker's subsistence. And then the worker produces more than, the, than his subsistence, produces more than his that it took to produce him, and that difference goes to the capitalist. Well, we then ask the question, what happens if a worker is paid more than his subsistence? What happens if a worker is paid 10 times his biological subsistence? Um, what about Tom Cruise, who's a laborer? He, he survives by the wages he's paid for what he does, uh, but he makes more in a month uh, than is necessary to live for the rest of his life. Um, <clears throat> what Marx says here is that subsistence, uh, he says various different things at different times, but he says that there's a historical and moral element in subsistence. Okay? So it's not a biologically defined concept. So what does that mean? What it means, if we're looking at a theory and trying to test it, we should consider what difference it makes in empirical terms. If we want to describe the world in terms of Marxist theory of surplus value, in empirically testable propositions, uh, what can we say? Well, all we can say is that the total revenue from sales of the product are going to be greater than the wage bill. Right? That's all we can say. 
And we knew that before we started. We didn't need Marx to tell us that. We'd known that 500 years before Marx. Right? That if you have savings and you invest those savings in anything, in a factory or anything else, uh, you're, you can expect a return. Um, and that return is not based on your labor, it's based on the savings you contributed. So this is not a new discovery. Uh, it's something that, that Marx knew to begin with, and we all knew before Marx started. So in, in other words, what this means is, I would suggest, that the theory of surplus value doesn't have any empirically testable consequences. Because subsistence can mean anything at all. Anything at all can be subsistence. Um, so it's not biologically defined. Um, and the only thing that is in the theory that is undoubtedly true is that the selling price of the product is greater than the wage bill. We knew that before we started, and every theory has a way of explaining that. So I would say we don't have a scientific theory here. Uh, we have a way of describing things, uh, and this way of describing things doesn't generate any new empirical consequences that we can test. Um, now, before I leave this question of surplus value, let me say this, there is one final problem with it, it seems to me. Um, and that is, what's the point of it? What is the point of Marx's theory of surplus value? Now, if you are naive, you went to a Chicago public school, for example. Um, if you're naive, you might um, say, well, it's obvious. The work has been robbed by the capitalists. And I would say, well, so what? What does that really mean? Um, I mean, so Marx is calling for a huge social revolution. Uh, suppose that social revolution leads to the workers' income being lower than it is now then you could say that the return the capitalist is taking is the price of keeping the workers' wage as high as it is. Uh, and by the way, we, should talk, we, we could just as easily talk about the surplus value that goes to the capitalist as being the capitalist subsistence. So, it's not clear. You see, Marx is not proposing a system. If, this would make perfect sense if Marx was proposing a system where he said, we're going to get rid of the capitalists, and we're going to give all that difference to the workers. But Marx is not proposing any such thing, and would ridicule as bourgeois utopian socialism anybody who suggested such a thing. He would say that's absolute nonsense. Um, so, in that case, uh, where are we going with this idea? And by the way, I should, I should mention here this is not a hugely important thing, but it is something you should bear in mind. Marx talks about workers and capitalists. But of course, the great majority of capitalists are also workers, and the great majority of workers are also capitalists. That's to say, most people are employed for a wage or salary. The salary would still be a worker in Marx's term. Um, also have savings on which they receive interest. Like in today's society, they have a 401k or some other kind of IRA. Um, so anybody who's got stocks or bonds or has a savings account where the bank holds the stocks or bonds um, is getting surplus value that is supposedly by exploitation of the workers. So that's something to bear in mind. Everybody, not everybody, but the great majority of people are both workers and capitalists. But we're looking at them in different roles. So. <clears throat> Uh, finally, on this question of volume one of capital, or capital, the, the whole analysis of capital, I should draw attention to something called the transformation problem. I'll just I'll state this very briefly, and if anybody's interested, we can go into it in the discussion. If labor is the sole source of value, and if profit, as well as interest and rent, are due to unpaid labor, then you might expect that labor-intensive kinds of production would have a higher rate of return than capital-intensive kinds of production, right? Some, some uh, types of production require a lot more capital 
in relation to labor. Now, Marx's terminology here is different, but we shouldn't be witched by terminology. Marx will talk about, Marx talked about capital as being dead labor, and he talked about labor as being living labor. But don't be bewitched by the terminology. It's capital and labor. So a type of production where there is a lot of, ca uh, a lot of capital in relation to labor, since the capitalist has to pay for the capital, you would expect to have a lower rate of return than a type of production where there is not much capital in relation to labor. And Marx mentions this in volume one of Capital, which, remember, is a, complete, a completed, polished uh, uh, work seen off the press by Marx himself. Um, Marx acknowledges this and says, we're going to get back to this in volume three, and we're going to answer this problem. And you'll be surprised at the answer, right? Uh, so this helped Marx a lot, because volume one was was um, in existence for a long time before the, the, before the notes for volumes two, three, and four were available. And people said, well, this seems pretty impressive. There are a few obvious problems with it, but he says he's going to answer it in volume three. <laughs> so this is great. <laughs> uh, it, it, this is good. Nice work if you can get it. Now, um, when volume three, or the Marx's notes for volume three were eventually published, it became apparent that Marx really had no answer to this. And what he said is this, value is produced according to la living labor only, but in the capitalist market it is reallocated to different lines of production in according to the total outlay. So everybody gets the same rate of return. The rate of return in capitalist intensive industries is just the same as the rate of return in labor intensive industries because the market is doing this job of reallocating the surplus value. It's taking the surplus value from the labor intensive industries and giving it to the capital intensive industries. Well, the problem with this is this is totally, what's the word? It's to totally redundant because a much simpler theory is that the rate of return is not generated by labor alone, but by all the factors of production, including capital, working together. Uh, that still leaves the problem of where you get the profit, but however, it does uh, mean that this, this development in volume three, where Marx tries to take care of this transformation problem, uh, doesn't really work. And now the transformation problem is the problem of converting values into prices. Because Marx is insistent that you cannot explain market prices without his concept of value. So there have been a few writers who have said, um, well, Marx isn't trying to explain mar market prices. That's all wrong. They are mistaken. Marx is trying to explain market prices. And if his theory does not explain market prices, it fails as a theory. Um, there has been a lot of work on the mathematics of converting values into prices. It's called the transformation problem. First of all, it's been shown that it mathematically cannot be solved. That's the first thing. Uh, and if anybody's interested, I can mention a few places where you can read about this. It cannot be solved mathematically. There is no way to do it. But secondly, if you step back from this and you really understand it and you take a good strong look at it, there is something very weird about this, because any input could be taken as the sole creator of value. We could say we have a paper theory of value, and the amount of value is totally generated by the amount of paper required in production, socially necessary paper. Uh, and anybody who produces uh, something for sale without using paper, that's an imaginary price, right? Um, and what the market does is the allocates all the surplus value generated by the paper intense, by the non-paper intensive industries, and gives it to the paper intensive industries. So we can do it with any input. We can do it with copper. We can do it with lead. We can do it with oil. We can do it with land. We can do it with capital. Uh, and um, mathematically, these are identical. But no reason has been given why we should select one rather than another. So that's what I'm going to say right now about about um, the theory of surplus value. So now, the materialist conception of history, or sometimes called historical materialism, this is the same thing that Engels said at Marx's 
graveside uh, was the great discovery of Marx. Now, let me say this at the outset, that I think that these two theories are very, very different. Um, the theory of surplus value, I think, is definitely incorrect. The materialist conception of history, I think, is ambiguous. Uh, it has strengths and weaknesses, and according to exactly how you define it, you're going to get different results. Um, and the materialist conception of history draws attention to certain things that we should be aware of. Uh, so, what, do, what shall I say about the materialist conception of history? Now, there is no agreement about what the materialist conception of history is, except that it has something to do with the primacy of the economic over other areas of life in determining how society works out, right? That's putting it very, very broadly. Now, in the, the, most, the most extended passage that Marx ever wrote expanding the materialist conception of history is about half a page. And it's in the preface to the uh, tour critique of uh, 1859 that I mentioned. Um, and um, he makes a number of points there. And he describes, he says that society rests upon a base. And this base is the economic relations. And it's clear from what he says that what he means is the basic rules governing the economy, especially property law. That's the base. Then there is something else at work which he calls the forces of production. And for the sake of brevity and simplicity in this discussion, I'm going to say that forces of production means technology. So Marx has a theory. And he's the he has a theory of social change. And it goes like this. Changes occur in technology. These changes bring about changes in economy, or the social relations of production, or the legal framework of the economy. And these changes, in turn, bring about changes throughout the whole of culture, throughout religion, politics, philosophy, and everything else. That's Marx's theory. And um, <clears throat> what, what do we make of this? Well, it seems to me that that scenario, which I just mentioned, is a scenario that does occur. It sometimes does occur that a change in technology leads to a change in the fundamental rules of the economy, which in turn leads to a change in the entire outlook and uh, zeitgeist of the population. It changes their religion, changes everything. Um, a simple example of this would be to my mind, would be the Plains Indians. When settlers, European settlers in the United States, mostly descended from people in the British Isles, moved west, they encountered Plains Indians. These Plains Indians hunted buffalo on horseback. Not buffalo on horseback. These Indians on horseback hunted the buffalo. Um, and occasionally you'd have a conversation with one of these Plains Indians, and they would say that, from the foundation of the earth, their ancestors had always hunted the buffalo on horseback. Uh, and um, their entire religion, uh, their system of cosmology, centered around this being on horseback, men, men only on horseback, hunting the buffalo. And anybody listening to them expound their worldview would say, OK. Now, we know, unless we went to Chicago Public School, uh, we know uh, what these Plains Indians didn't, and what most of those white settlers didn't. And that is that all the horses that these Indians had had been descended from horses that had been brought over by the Spaniards no earlier than the end of the 15th century. So in other words, what must have happened, and what we know did happen, uh, is that you know, the rare horses in North America many thousands of years ago, but they all died out. In fact, a very important part of the evolution of the horse uh, is in North America, but, but at certain times when it gets cold enough, uh, animals and, and humans can walk across the Ber what is now the Bering Straits, right? They can walk from Siberia to Alaska or from Alaska to Siberia. So an important part of the evolution of the horse took place in North America, but then 
those horses went to Siberia, and horses died out in North America. Um, we also know from the Book of Mormon that there were horses. Right, right, so that proves it. Uh, but those horses, those horses had died out before Columbus discovered America. Okay, so what must have happened is that the that once the Spaniards started bringing over horses in uh, after 1492, um, some of these horses would occasionally escape, and occasionally two of them would escape of opposite sexes, um, and um, so you'd get a population of wild horses. And then this population of wild horses radiated out and radiated into the interior of North America. And some of the Indians, who would never have dreamed of thinking they could bring down a buffalo, realized, maybe by watching the Spaniards, but maybe just from their own observation and thinking, that it was possible to ride these horses and use them to hunt buffalo. Uh, and so you have this... The forces of production change because the Indians now have something that enables them to hunt buffalo. <coughs> Brings about a complete change in the, in the economic organization of these tribes of Indians. And that brings about a complete and total change in their cosmology, in the way they view the world, in their philosophy. So they, that's an example, and I think it's, uh, there are many other examples, but that's, a, I think, a good example of Marx's scenario. Change in the forces of production causes change in the relations of production, changes the whole social order. Um, however, there are certain questions. Um, the use of the forces of production is itself an intellectual thing. People who use tools understand what they're doing. And you can't make sense of how people use tools without presupposing that they have some understanding, maybe limited, but they have some understanding of what they're doing. Um, so this is not really historical materialism. Mm. This is not that something non-intellectual is causing something intellectual. It's, and many people who believe in historical materialism would agree with this. It's one intellectually dominated area affecting another intellectually dominated area. Now, <clears throat> some people will tell you, uh, that will try to suggest to you, and I think that Engels did this sometimes, that um, historical materialism must be true because people must eat before they can do anything else. And it's like a self-evident truism, right? You have to eat before you can philosophize. Therefore, the explanation for what you philosophize is that you had to uh, struggle to get something to eat. That seems obvious. Well, it's, that's a load of baloney, isn't it? I mean, just think about it. I mean, supposing that, um, supposing that I build a robot that is, has a computer for a brain, and it, I can build this robot, it can play golf, let's say, uh, or it can play the piano, or it can dig ditches, whatever I design it to do. But every now and then it has to refuel itself, and it, it does this by plugging into an uh, electronic outlet and, and recharging its batteries. Now, what sense does it make to say that whatever that robot does is governed by its act of recharging its batteries? Makes no sense at all. So that is um, a, a hopeless sort of argument. Um, <clears throat> changes in ideas obviously affect the tools people use. And there are certain very obvious examples of this. Um, Jews and Muslims are not allowed to eat pork, and that means they don't raise pigs. Chinese if you don't count the western part of China where there are some Muslims. Uh, pork is basically the only meat they know, and it, it, the word for meat in Chinese is the same as the word for pork. Uh, so these are different intellectual ideas that come from cosmology and religion that are affecting uh, the system of, uh, of production. Now, um, let me try to uh, put some of these confused and, ver and fluctuating ideas into a, a more cogent form. Now, this was done by a man called Holpike, who wrote a book called Principles of Social Evolution. And what Holpike, Holpike wanted to test the materialist conception of history. He wanted to test it. And, what, and he came up with this idea, which is quite ingenious, I think. Sometimes a tribe of human beings will, will, will split and go their different ways. And sometimes one of the tribe, one of the splits, will take up a different method of production than the other. 
So sometimes there will be, uh, the, the, the tribe will be united by its basic beliefs and by its um, religion and uh, uh, language and so on, and basic concepts. Uh, so the tribe splits. One goes off in one direction and adopts a different technology because it moves to a different geographical location or because it sees other people around it doing something different. Um, and you also get different tribes with very different alien, or different alien to each other origins adopting the same technology. Well, what that means is you can perform an experiment. You can make a list of all these. This is what in basically ethnography, that is to say, um, noting down what different populations of human beings do and think and believe and act uh, and comparing them. Well, what you can do is you can look at different tribes uh, with the same technology but different ancestral backgrounds and therefore uh, different cultures or different technologies but the same ancestral background and therefore the same um, uh, basic beliefs and, uh, and, and religion and so on. Uh, and so Paul Pike did this and he actually did it systematically. He looked at, made a list of all the most important uh, institutions in the society uh, and tabulated them. Um, and his conclusion was that origin vastly swamped mode of production. In other words, what this shows is that, it, that a particular population of human beings, their social institutions, are more governed by the ideas they bring to the table than by the methods of production they use, which is contrary to the, uh, to the uh, materialist conception of history. Now, you might try to come up with a, a, a version of the materialist conception of history that allows that result, but I would say it's going to be pretty feeble and pretty dilute. Now, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I was going to complete, complete this by talking about Marx's theory of revolution, but I'm receiving signals that uh, I should wind it up at this point. So I'll talk about Marx's theory. I'll, I'll smuggle in my things about Marx's theory of revolution in, the, in my responses to questions. Yes. Thank you. First question. What is your beef against the Chicago public schools? Oh, uh, well, I mean, they are the worst public schools, and public schools generally don't do a very good job. That's basically my point. Um, what about charter schools? Charter schools are better than others, uh, but, um, you know, um, uh, that my daughter Emma over there uh, is homeschooled. Uh, how are you doing, Emma? <laughs> Do you think you know more or less about history than people who went to a Chicago public school? Better say more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, the latest thing came out, I think it was Nike shoes, which cost a dollar fifty to produce, but Nike makes a hundred and fifty dollars from those shoes, which is out and out exploitation of labor. How do you explain that? Yeah. Uh, well, um, first of all. Um, I think you'll find, if you look into it, that, that Nike has other expenses. Uh, in other words, it may be that at the factory where they produce, it's $1.50 or whatever you said it was. That's uh, it's perfectly understandable. But in order to distribute these shoes throughout the world, so on and so forth, there are other expenses. So, um, I mean, let, let me say this. I mean, there's a general, a, a general sort of principle that if you look at production in a capitalist society, uh, the rate of return is going to be the same in all industries. It must be, right? Uh, because if it's low in one, in, in one industry and high in another, capital will be moved from the industry where there's a low return to the industry where there's a high return. So the the, 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 the the, amount, the, the rate of return will even out. So without looking, you can be sure that the rate of return in the oil industry is exactly the same as the rate of return 
in the shoe industry, and the rate of return in the shoe industry is exactly the same as the rate of return in the computer industry, and so on. You can be sure of that, because if it won't, uh, that would immediately be taken care of. And, you, and occasionally, when you see some big dislocation occurs, uh, like the oil shock in the 1970s, or something like that, where suddenly there's a whole branch of industry is losing money heavily, you'll see that within a couple of months, they've written down all those... Um, all those terrible malinvestments, and they've moved stuff out, they close plant, they, and, uh, and that capital goes elsewhere uh, to uh, other industries which are making a profit. So you, you, you will always find, and if we want to know what the, what the rate of return to Nike is, we'll look at the Nike annual report to shareholders and we'll find out what it is. But you can be sure that it's the same as, roughly the same as that of all other uh, major industries. That's to say it would be somewhere you know, in the region of 5 or 10 percent. So um, you're li when you say $1.50 and $150, uh, I mean, obviously, if you go into a shoe shop, uh, you have to pay the rent of the shoe shop, the electricity of the shoe shop, the wages of the people in the shoe shop, and so on. Uh, if, you, if you buy a pair of Nike shoes in Chicago, and they were made in Taiwan or Burma, uh, you have to pay for the transportation to bring them from there to here, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, you know, it's misleading just to say at the site of the factory that uh, it's $1.50. Um, I but, a but, but also, um, why suppose that if there is a big markup, what you're saying is a big markup means exploitation of labor. Well, why should it mean that? Why shouldn't it mean a big exploitation of capital or a big ex okay. exploitation of the landowner? Why pick on labor? Um, you know, it's not clear. That's Charles. Yeah, David, why are you having such a problem with surplus value? And it's certainly not limited to some entertainment people. The CEOs keep three to four hundred times <coughs> the wealth of the employees in the corporations. They're fresh. I just want to show you. That, well, some workers that are paid surplus more than others. Value is is Some workers are paid more than others. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, disproportionately. You're and who's to say what the proportion you, is? You seem to think it's like Hollywood types, it's some unique situation. This is go to any corporation in this country, and it's evident. It's not a unique. Well, well. It's more the rule than the exception. That, <coughs> and the value of the products produced. The, well, well, first of all, I mean, if, 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 you look at a, if you look at a company and the people at the top are making 500 times what the people at the bottom are making, uh, both of those are part of the expenses of the company. So it, if you're looking at the surplus value, you look at the dividends paid to shareholders. The CEO is an expense? Uh, uh, the CEO is a, is a productive laborer. A manager is a productive laborer. And Marx actually admits that managers are productive. I mean, by the way, to Marx, Marx has a big, uh, uh, several discussions of productive and unproductive, uh, and he doesn't think that unproductive laborers are any less workers than productive laborers. So that's one thing. But um, he, but managers are productive laborers, uh, and as Marx points out, they'd be necessary in communism. Um, and um, uh, I think CEOs are paid. Uh, according to what they contribute, uh, and um, uh, just like any, just now, of course, there are problems in measurement. Uh, not all. I mean, I don't think I'm paid as much as I contribute. Um, uh, I've yet to say the. I've yet to see the picket line that has it saying uh, we are paid less than our marginal product. <laughs> um, but I, you, you never know. Um, but um, no, most workers think they're paid less than what they contribute. But. Um, there, there are bound to be inaccuracies, but broadly speaking, I think workers are paid what they contribute, and I think a CEO can, is paid a lot more than their salaries than, the, than, the, than the office more, secretary because he contributes. Times. Yes, and I think they contribute that much. More. <laughs> what? Yes. Do you think? How, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Um, oh God. Oh God. Let me ask you this. Uh, the average the average worker in this country gets about what fifty thousand a year. Labor creates wealth. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you think that Steve Jobs produced more than the average laborer in this country? No, I think that girl in China gave a lecture on it. <laughs> Foxconn. Yeah. 
made the see, you're not, you see, you're not yeah. being serious. He didn't do anything. You're not being serious. Yeah, yeah, right. You're lecture. not being serious. No, That's I, yeah, well, you didn't see the lecture. I'm very serious. Um, I'm working 15 hours a day. <laughs> Who created the wealth of that company? Who would have, who invented the iPhone? It's a question of the value of the labor as well as the number of hours. And, and, and Steve Jobs worked a lot more than 15 you know, hours a day. I don't but, have but, any, um, I know who created the wealth in that, in that company. Well, I yeah. got a picture of her working with Charles, we have to end uh, this. All right. Uh, All right, next, next question. question. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> yes, uh, Victor. Well, um, Loud, please. you are drawing those uh, labels, socialist, communist, uh, as applied to a person and as applied to a country. First of all, there is no country, or ever existed a country, or there still exists a country that is communist. You can call it communist it's a country, but there is no such thing. Nobody achieved that so-called state of being, economic, political, and and, and a guy that calls himself a socialist, that, that means that he is aspiring communist. I, I'm not clear there, and so... Okay, well let me uh, elucidate that. Um, first of all, when, when I talk about Marx, or people in the past, especially in the 19th century, or for that matter in, in, the, um, in the 20th century, uh, but especially in the 19th century. When I talk about socialism and communism, uh, I'm concerned to find out how people used these words at the time and what they meant by them. Uh, and one of the things I observe, uh, one of the things I know quite a bit about, is the changing usages of those terms. Um, now, um, by the way, you said something I completely agree with. There has never been a communist society. That's absolutely true. Um, and that's the point I, I was planning to get to. Um, uh, and one of the things that you should understand about Marx is that Marx did not envision or propose anything remotely like the Soviet Union. Marx's idea of communism was nothing like the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, the Soviet Union didn't call itself communist, it called itself socialist. But, um, if you look at, I can tell you about the historically changing meanings or usages of the terms socialism and communism. I can tell you about that. That's something I know quite a bit about. Um, now, Marx, when he became a communist in the early 1840s, consistently referred to himself as a communist uh, and did not call himself a socialist. And he regarded socialism as in Pierre-Joseph Proudhon as being something he was opposed to, a middle class idea that he was opposed to, right? So, now, around the time of Marx's death, um, for various reasons, one of which was the, the growth of this Social Democratic Party in Germany, which was a, a, a unification of Marxists and Lasallians, they, they got this party together, and it soon became the biggest political party in Germany, although illegal. Um, and, uh, for various reasons associated with that, at around the time of the death of Marx, Marxists, not me, Marxists, started using the word socialism instead of communism. And in fact, after Engels died, the, leader, the leading Marxist in the world, according to most Marxists, was a man called Karl Kautsky. Uh, and he often said in his speeches and, and pamphlets, uh, <coughs> We used to call it communism, now we call it socialism. It means exactly the same thing, right? That's what Kautsky uh, said. So <clears throat> those are two examples of usages of the term. Now in 1917, Lenin introduced a new thing, which Marx, okay, step back. Marx talked about an initial phase of communism and a higher phase of communism, right, in his, uh, marginal comments on the before, Gota, Gota program. Before Lenin, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but he didn't distinguish between socialism and communism as successive stages. He talked about communism coming right after capitalism uh, and having an early phase where he said 
that goods we would be distributed by labor vouchers, and a higher phase, where, which was communism, by which goods would be distributed according to the principle of from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, meaning that people would take what they wanted from the common store without paying a price for it. Mm -hmm. Now, so those are two, exam two phases of communism that Marx talked about. Uh, so, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in talking about these topics, but when I talk about the usages of the words, I'm simply trying to find out what people meant by them at the time. Do you define, uh, just, the President Roosevelt was called a um, uh, socialist. Uh, using the term socialist uh, in a loosely terms, what percentage do you think England is socialist or Denmark? Um, I, I'm not quite sure what the meaning of the question is. I, d I mean, I would, I would, let me tell you, I, so I won't give a direct answer, but I will say this. Um, the United Kingdom and Denmark, in my opinion, should be judged as capitalist societies. And in my opinion, would it, if Marx was alive today and could see them, he would call them capitalist societies. Why do I say that? I say that. Well, there is, in both countries, a stock exchange. Uh, there are, in both countries, there are banks. In both countries, a very large proportion of the assets are privately owned and traded. Uh, in both uh, countries, the allocation of resources is mainly governed by unplanned uh, market forces driven by the most profitable line to invest in. So on those grounds, I would say that those countries and the United States are capitalists, and, and Russia are capitalists. Um, so uh, if, if you mean the, the opinions of the people, I would say that the, the people who, that depends on your exact definition of socialism. I would say that very few people in any of those three countries I've just mentioned, four countries I've just mentioned, uh, would be socialist in the sense that the immediate Marxists in the years after Marx's death would have, would have called it. In fact, I would say that one of, the, one of the major features of the world that we have to take account of is that socialism has declined in popularity greatly since the death of Marx. Okay. If Marx were alive today, what do you think he would say about the owners of Walmart saying that, uh, like one guy said, I can't pay my people a living wage yet because I only have $22 billion in the bank. <laughs> that, that's, that's capitalism in itself, right? No. Well, well, first of all, people who work for Walmart do get a living wage. So if he said that, he was making a mistake. Um, because people who work for Walmart do live. Um, but um, the fact that he has... Uh, savings in the bank, uh, and what he's paying his workers, to me, there's no relation between those whatsoever. I mean, I don't see why he would expect, is he supposed, because he's got a lot of money in the bank, he's supposed to be charitable to his workers or something? That makes no sense. The workers are paid what they're worth, and Walmart delivers a service to consumers that is very valuable and makes a lot of people's lives a lot better. Um, and that's the end of it. I don't see that how much, how much he's got in the bank has anything to do with what he pays his workers. Save money, live better, right? Yeah, maybe you missed my question. Uh, you know, Marx would. What, Ma oh, what Marx would say? What would Marx say about this? Huge I don't think. I don't think yeah. he would approach it in those terms. I mean, you're morally scandalized by the fact that he's very rich and his workers are not uh, are low paid. That's. But Marx wouldn't look at it like that. Uh, I think Marx would. If, well, okay. What we have to we have to have two scenarios, right? Marx is suddenly brought back to life today and has learned nothing <coughs> since uh, 1883. Right, or since 1867 when he finished the first volume of Capital. Uh, that's what he would say. And then there's Marx is brought alive today, and then he's given a week or two in the library to catch up on things. Uh, and I think he would change his ideas a lot because, of, because the world has turned out so very differently to what he expected. Um, and one of the things he would notice is that he was predicting the imminence of a communist revolution, whereas today 
um, long after, more, way more than a hundred years after his death, there is no communism anywhere. Um, and that would cause him to ask why and to look into that. So, but if, if, we, if we go to the first question, Marx is brought back from the dead and has learned nothing, then certainly Marx would say that the workers in Walmart are exploited. But he would also say that Tom Cruise is exploited because the, the movies make more than what Tom Cruise is paid. So it doesn't, so, you know, <coughs> Marx used the expression, be his payment high or low. Marx didn't think the workers were exploited because they were low paid. He thought that they were exploited because the selling price of their product was greater than what they were paid. That's a different thing. Uh, and, yeah, so that's... I, I guess my, my question is that did, uh, all of Marx's philosophy, did, did he have, have any kind of grasp or did he look at the, the moral aspects of some people getting super rich off the work of others where others are, you know, the workers are struggling to survive while other people are uh, living in golden castles? Uh, you know, because, you know, that's exploitation of the workers. Well, I, no, I, I, no, no, it, no, that, that's not exploitation. Yes, well, just because some people are very rich and some people are very poor, it doesn't mean there's any exploitation. Um, that, that is jumping, jumping to a conclusion. Um, but, um, uh, for instance, you are fabulously wealthy compared with most inhabitants of Africa. But that do doesn't mean that you are exploiting the inhabitants of Africa. Right. right? Yeah. So the question of whether one person has a lot of money and a lot of, uh, another person has little has nothing whatsoever to do. Uh, and it also, according to Marx, although he doesn't lay any emphasis on this, it's possible for a poor person to exploit a rich person. If, if you've got shares in a company, you could be a widow just scraping by and living on your, uh, on your dividends from those shares. Uh, and yet the workers in that company could be paid a hundred times what your income is. Okay. You, you are still exploiting them in Marx's theory. So there is a complete separation between differentials of wealth and exploitation. This is Marx's theory. I'm telling you what Marx's theory is. Um, now, look, many people in, throughout history, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries, have believed that workers are exploited by capitalists. And Marx's theory is only one theory to account for this, and I have not claimed to answer all the theories. Now, I don't think that capitalists do exploit workers, typically, um, but I don't claim that I pre presented any arguments against other arguments you may have. But in, I'm just looking at Marx's theory. Marx's theory does not say, this person is rich, this person is poor, therefore this person must be exploiting this, per this person. That is very far removed okay. from what Marx was saying. And Marx would, I can just imagine Marx um, blistering attack on some uh, bourgeois fool who came out with that notion. Uh, it, it's completely alien to Marx's thinking. Marx's theory of exploitation is very specific. It's based on unpaid labor. Okay. Uh, All right, Mike Foley. We're going to have to uh, maybe shut down questions after a couple more because it's already uh, 8.08. So we're going to have to move maybe. We don't, yeah, we don't have any surplus time. Yeah, we don't have any surplus time. Mike? How can you call the United States a capitalist country when the government gave a $185 billion welfare check to the people who own General Motors? It gave a $185 billion welfare check to the people who own AIG Insurance Company. And it gave multi-billion dollar welfare checks to the then biggest banks in this country. And part two is, how can you call the United Kingdom a capitalist entity when the United Kingdom don't even call itself capitalist? Because a kingdom is an entity based on murder and slavery. Uh, okay, well that's so an how interesting. Can you call those that, that's a very capital? interesting two questions, actually. And I wish I had an hour to answer the, the <laughs> questions. Um, Let's take, the United, let's take the United Kingdom first. Uh, uh, first of all, in the, in the United Kingdom, which is, for those of you who don't, for those of you who went to a Chicago public school, <laughs> consists of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, right? That's the meaning of the United Kingdom. Um, the, the monarch, the king or queen, has very little... Scotland is part of Great Britain. Um, uh, it may not be for long, but it is. Um, now, uh, the monarch has very little power. The monarch is, is rather symbolic. Um, it would not change the day-to-day -day lives of many people if the monarchy was abolished. Uh, so, um, it basically, 
Um, and the monarch doesn't govern. The government is, government is headed by the parliament. It's headed by the prime minister and the cabinet who are responsible to parliament. Right? So it's a democratic political system. Um, and so that's part of it. It's the kingdom, whatever you might think about kingdoms, kings or kingdoms, it's not really a kingdom except in, a, in, a, um, except in the sense that, um, the, that God is the head of the Vatican, right? I mean, it's only it's in a ceremonial and symbolic sense that it's a kingdom. Uh, the, the monarch doesn't really have much say at all. Um, now, how can I say that I agree that, that um, the United States government gives billions to big capitalists in corporate welfare. And I'm opposed to it, and I think it should stop. But even while it goes on, I would still say that the United States is fundamentally a capitalist country for the reasons I gave. That um, a very large, there is a stock market, there, there are banks, these are signs of financial operations, right? And these financial operations involve a very large share of the assets of the country, the land, the capital, uh, the, the workers and so on. Um, and, the, and there is a big system of allocation of these resources by market forces, oh, by competing capitalists. Now, there is also an interference with that system by the government. And uh, whatever you think of that, uh, but, it, but it has not been replaced by a Soviet system. Um, and um, where, the, where, the, where private industry is outlawed, essentially, right? It's, it's not been replaced by that. It's still fundamentally a capitalist system, I think. That's my view. Okay. Job creators, Mike uh, C. Job creators. Uh, Ed and then Howard. Okay, last two. Thank you, I read a book of mine, The Federal Reserve, from okay. the... Uh, Who has the next question? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat your question, please? I read a book from the, the, the fellow who wrote the Federal Reserve from in the 90s, late 90s. And in that book, he said that uh, as a question, he asked all the people, all the PhDs in the Federal Reserve to weigh the G, uh, GDP, gross national Cup, GMP, right? From 1900 until today. And they, they went about doing it. And they found that as time went on, decades went on, the weight of the gross national product fell significantly because we're no longer making steel, coal, oil, cars, car train. We're making software, apps, Facebooks, Googles that are like, employ a lot of people, sell a lot of things, Microsoft, Apple. And would Marx's thought hold value in a world where the things that are purchased and exchanged have like so little value in a sense. They're just thought products. Um, well, let me, I, I'm not sure if I got what you was, when you said weight, did you mean literal physical weight? L physical right. weight. Yeah, well, this now, over time that has just dropped significantly because we're into such another world from what was the factory production of, yes. of his time. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I, this this is, well, it's very true. that I didn't know that the physical weight had fallen, but I'm not surprised. Uh, and uh, it bears out something I do believe in, and that is that economic value is a very different thing from sheer physical quantity. And you can have a great increase in economic value without a great increase in physical quantity, or even with a uh, constriction of physical quantity. And many things are much more useful because they're smaller, for example. So the question is, does, would Marx develop his theory, or does Marx's theory hold water in the, in the world we live in? Today? Well, I don't think that Marx's theory is the best theory to account for the economy in, in Marx's time or in ours. I do think that there are certain common... Marxist theory shares a lot in, with other theories. Uh, it's not totally alien from the theory of Ricardo, for example, or the theory of John Stuart Mill. Um, and it seems to me that and, and a lot of that has been retained in modern economic theory. And I think it's perfectly valid. I, I mean, the fact that you're selling something uh, which embodies a lot of ideas and not much physical weight, doesn't, I don't think that changes the basic uh, rules of economics. No, but it doesn't fit in Marx. 
Why doesn't it fit in Mao specifically? Where is the labor? <coughs> well, um, if you're selling, uh, you have to, you have to create. Someone has to create the software. For it's example, an idea. right? Facebook Having an idea can be late. Facebook is an idea. It takes mm -hmm. time. Somebody had to code on that. It just didn't happen by right. itself. No, I mean, I mean, um, I, I think I, I can, I can see the possibility of um, an, a diff, another criticism of the labor theory of value, if you like, based on what you've said, and that would be that, um, that would be that it's odd that if you look at something like Facebook, um, there are of course lots of workers who are producing stuff for the Facebook company uh, and who are getting paid, and the Facebook company gets in more money. And it pays those workers, so in that sense, it follows that same uh, model. Uh, but it, you could argue that it's, that's obviously so irrelevant to the basic economics of Facebook, which is um, getting a lot of people together uh, and communicating with each other, uh, that it does invalidate Marx. I would have to think about that. But I mean, I, I do think the labor theory of value is false, and uh, this could be another way of proving it false. Uh, Howard, I'm asking you something beyond your study of Marx, which is looking at the world economy, where do you have the best system currently? I'm looking at the Scandinavian countries, uh, Denmark, Sweden, that you have for the efficiencies of capitalism, but a heavy taxation that pays for retirement and other things. Uh, you don't have that in this country or in most of Europe. But where what, is, what is Social Security? No, I mean, you don't have a, an extensive level of The Social Security pays part of it. But in uh, Denmark and Sweden, uh, you just go into the uh, old people's home and your, uh, your expenses are taken care of, you know. I'm asking where you think you get the optimum uh, social benefit uh, at the, uh, uh, consistent with reality, okay? Right, I mean, purely on the factual issue here, um, the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank, produces every year a ranking of the countries of the world according to economic freedom, as defined by the American Enterprise Institute, yeah. which means uh, it's mostly also. concerned with business freedom, freedom of uh, businesses to do what they like irrespective of government regulation. One of the things that happened a few years ago is in that listing, Denmark moved ahead of the United States in economic freedom. Denmark is now closer to laissez-faire than the United States. And, you, and people who at the American Enterprise Institute compile this have predicted, and it's very obvious, that in the next few years, Sweden and Norway will also be more economically free by this standard than, than the United States. And one of the things that has happened in recent years, which people, have, it used to be when I was a kid, people would say things that implied that the United States was an especially free economy, that it was old fashioned or something like that, that it was a late, closer to a laissez faire economy. What's happening now is that every year the United States in that ranking falls lower and lower and is moving rapidly and rapidly, I think. I'm not. I'm a European by background, so I think in terms of a century being rapid, right? Um, the the, um, the United States is rapidly moving away from being in the in the top group of most economically free countries, uh, and is moving way down uh, to more or less the middle of screwed up by government countries. So that would be my um, so that would be my fact. There's a factual question there. Uh, now. <clears throat> If you look at the Scandinavian, Scandinavian socialism, that's sometimes called, um, which is really Scandinavian welfare statism, uh, well, there's a big welfare state in the United States, there's a big welfare state in Britain. Um, what happens with big welfare states is they become um, financially insupportable. You know, they're, they're, because they're, like Social Security is becoming in the United States, it's just too expensive. Uh, and, the, the tax, and especially in countries where the where the age structure of the population is increasing, there's more and more old people in relation to young people. Um, so, I would say that some of the things that happened in Scandinavia were temporary and couldn't last, uh, and are being corrected now. And uh, 
there's political fluctuations across the world reflecting this. And I think, I do think personally, um, this is not something I've spoken about tonight, that uh, we're, we've, we're in the middle of a crisis of big government. And we're going to come out of it with much smaller governments, uh, with less government welfare provision and less government military spending and less government this and that. That's my view. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are now moving to our rebuttal period. How many of you have rebuttal remarks to make besides me? Uh, yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. About four minutes, Brom. Four minutes. Let's thank our speaker. I found, I found the speech very interesting, but very distorted. For instance, why do these corporations move from one low-wage country to another? They're constantly looking for lower and lower costs of labor, of labor power. And at first they moved south, and they thought, well, that's pretty low wage compared to the north. And then they moved overseas, offshore. They moved to China, Bangladesh, India, you name it. They moved all over the world to find the cheapest source of labor. Anywhere where the labor was uh, low, they would move there. Why? Because the rate of profit goes way, way up. And as far as a pair of Nikes, of course there's overhead. There's no doubt about it. But if you uh, have a worker making a dollar fifty off of a, a pair of uh, sneakers that cost one hundred and fifty dollars, even though you take down the cost of overhead, shipping, and middleman, and so forth and so on, the profit is still extremely high. You're talking eight percent. I just and, looked it up. Uh, well, let me speak one fool at a time. <laughs> and, uh, for instance, Lenin wrote this book, Before the Russian Revolution, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Why <coughs> imperialism? Because it gets a very high return on its profits. And it's able to bribe a certain section of labor, like, uh, let's say, people in what they call, used to call the labor aristocracy. The people that were maybe working in the automobile industry or working in another high-tech industry, they, they would be able to buy them off because the rate of profit was so high. And a lot of people got, became corrupted and started supporting the capital system. Oh, it's a marvelous system. Look at how much we're making here. But now what's happening, you can see what's happening now in the United States, the cost of labor is way down. If you work for Walmart, if you work for another company, what do you get? Eight and a quarter an hour? Nobody can live on that. So the profit's got to come from somewhere. And the profit comes from labor power. There's no doubt about it. For instance, you take a piece of wood. It's not worth anything. But if you take somebody that's able to carve something nice out of that wood, then they could sell it for a profit. And that's what the skilled labor goes into it, or any kind of labor goes into it. And then the entrepreneur could go and market this thing and make a big profit off of it. But eventually he gets a hold of the means of production, what he's talking about, about the factories, and they're able to produce in mass and the capitalist is not only exploiting one person or two persons, he's exploiting maybe 3,000 people or 10,000 people. And the more people he got, the more he could exploit. Okay. And the profits of the capitalists, I, the last I read, about 850 people control about half of the wealth of the planet. 
Now, if that isn't if that isn't uh, okay. exploitation of labor, I don't know what is. Yeah. I don't know what he does for a living, but he must be in the labor aristocracy, yeah. or he must be in the higher realms of management or something to come up with these theories. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Andy Anderson, and I run a uh, information service that's free. Uh, my brother and I run what's called the North Inf Northwest Information Service. We translate databases. It will take 10 or 15 or 20 books on a subject and translate that mass of paper into a one-page cliff notes that somebody can read. And we specialize in blacked-out subjects, things that reporters can get fired for writing about in America today. As I mentioned earlier, Censored News, uh, this is the 2014-2015 edition, these two books are loaded with stuff that's happening, uh, many of the stories of exploitation of workers all over the world by billionaire predators run wild. Char Charles Ferguson wrote this book, Predator Nation, and he talks about this is an updated version of uh, Professor John McMurtry's book from Canada. In 1999, Professor McMurtry wrote a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And his thesis was, take a look at the United States. If you don't regulate billionaire criminals, billionaire predators, as they get bigger and bigger, they'll be like unregulated sharks. They'll eat everything in history and destroy the, everything in, in sight and just destroy the country. And that's where we are today. Uh, the books on censored news describe the media process where it's a two-pronged process. They promote the mythology like uh, free enterprise or free society. Well, they simultaneously run a blackout on all the scientists that could puncture that myth very, very quickly. So people in America believe things that aren't real. Uh, their view of reality is uh, not in, in, uh, in step with what's actually happening out in the real world. Naomi Klein's rate, latest book, uh, there's two books on what's happening uh, in our, the climate change. Uh, Naomi Klein's first book, Shock Doctrine, described the activity of military, uh, mil the military industrial complex and, and uh, corporate predators just buying up everything in sight all over the world. The United States is currently running the largest welfare for billionaires program in the history of the human race. We're shoveling money to billionaires in ungodly amounts of money. Her last book was called This Changes Everything. She said the climate crisis gives us an opportunity to fix our broken economic system. So the idea that Walmart is uh, that there, there is no moral or ethical responsibility to pay your workers a living wage, that's been heavily promoted by the media in America, as if uh, $7.25 an hour was all that worker was worth. Uh, $7.25 an hour in almost any city in this country is a homeless shelter wage, unless you get assistance from other places, all kinds of welfare adding to your paycheck, you can't live anywhere realistically and pay rent except go to a homeless shelter and have enough money to get back and forth transportation to the job. Uh, it takes uh, between 18 and 22 dollars an hour, roughly $40,000 a year for a mother that has uh, two children, a, a single mom, if she wants to get out of a homeless shelter and live in rent an apartment anywhere in Chicago. The minimum living wage to live indoors in Chicago if you have kids is about 40 grand a year, other if you're supporting yourself. Otherwise, you have to get help from a whole bunch of entities, church, welfare, uh, you know, you name it. Anyway, the last thing I'll say, out of all the books I've translated over the years, this one, unprecedented, is going to be among my top five because he gives an accurate presentation, a summary of where we are with the rapid climate change and if we don't address that issue, then nothing else is going to matter within a few years. So if you know anybody that has young people under 30, uh, tell them about this book and uh, get one of the flyers that I have there. 
uh, later and you can get more information okay. from our service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the only uh, uh, the only part of communism that seems to make sense to me is the communist theory, uh, and one can argue that communism is correct in this way. Uh, it was stated that, uh, according to communist theory, that eventually the government would wither away. And that's what happened in the Soviet Union. So <laughs> one would have to argue that communism does work in that particular way if one wants to um, do that. Uh, I uh, was in a pawn shop one time, and a guy came in with a drill. It was a pretty nifty drill, and he said, what uh, can I get on this? And he said, five dollars. The guy said, are you kidding? He said, that drill cost ninety-five dollars. It's worth every bit of ninety-five dollars. The pawn shop guy really hit the nail on the head when he said, not to me it's not. So values are subjective. Something is only worth what someone is willing to pay for it. So if I uh, have a factory and part of my factory uh, does a lot of glass work, and I need a glazer in that factory, uh, I might be willing to pay a premium in order to have that glazer. But if there's a big surplus of glazers, well, then they might not be worth very much. So something is really only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. And incidentally, I experienced this when I lived in Florida. Cadillacs, late model Cadillacs, were very cheap because there were so many men who had been accountants and doctors and lawyers who retired and went to from New York and places like that and went to Florida to live and their doctor said, hey, you've got cataracts, you mustn't drive anymore. And cars were available. I Cadillacs, I think it's very cheap. Uh, and, and a lot of guys were actually going down to Florida to buy uh, cars and they'd drive them back north and sell them and make a great profit. So again, values are subjective and that's something that we need to keep in mind uh, and by the way according to the uh, communist doctrine values are not subjective they are it in other words if the government says a pound of coffee is three dollars that's the value uh, okay I want to say that Marx helped Engels a great deal in a way. Uh, you see, Marx had a maid, and his maid became pregnant. And uh, Marx couldn't let his wife know about this, or she probably would have left him. So he got Engels to take the blame for uh, this woman, this maid of his, becoming pregnant. So you could say that Marx helped Engels in a, uh, in a big way uh, by making it possible for him to have a grudge baby. Uh, that's when somebody had it in for him. All right, Bob, four minutes. All right. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Thank Mr. Steele. Another interesting presentation. Um, let me, uh, you know, shine a little more light here on the difference between political economy and what we know now as economics. Political economy is is really the the study of the uh, creation, distribution, um, 
uh, all these things. I'll leave it at that. The creation and the distribution of wealth. And economics, what we know is modern economics today, is really the, the study of pricing, scientific study of pricing. I study political economy, at Henry George School, have for many years, read lots of books about it, and I run the political economy book club. Um, so we look at basically the three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. We look at everything through those, those three, three things, and uh, land is everything in the physical universe. Land includes the magnetic spectrum. Uh, land includes water and fish and trees. You know, everything, everything that was, it's natural, natural, all naturally occurring phenomena is land, okay? And labor, of course, is the you know, human effort. And when labor is exerted upon land, that creates wealth. And wealth that is used to create more wealth is called capital. So in other words, if I see a tree, say in a simple state of uh, civilization, I see a tree with apples on it, that's land. When I go pick those apples, now I've now created wealth. I have these apples in my hand. They're personal wealth. Because if, if I eat them, they're personal wealth. But if I take some to the market to sell, those ones that I'm going to sell are, are this capital. So kind of a simple way of, of looking at things. Pricing is the best <coughs> feedback mechanism for economic planning that there's, there's ever been. When uh, Roosevelt's guys came in, came in power and they tried to set up all these government agencies to regulate everything under the sun, basically, they were trying to set you know, production amounts and things like that and set wages and prices and, and things. It was a complete disaster. <coughs> and this is why socialism or communism will never work anything in government planning because once you get away from the feedback of pricing, uh, you know, it's, it's nearly impossible. But when you have thousands and thousands and thousands of small businessmen every day making these little decisions, you know, they know which color shoe is selling better or what style or whatever it happens to be, uh, you know, that feedback gets all built into the system and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it works right. And by the way, I should mention, yeah, again, this labor theory of value, probably Marx's biggest mistake. Uh, something is only worth what somebody else will give you for it. And I, just, I still see this misconception all the time. I just had a discussion with a filmmaker the other day who spent, uh, you know, I don't know how much on this film, a lot, you know, uh, for his mind, uh, thousands of dollars. And, uh, and he was thinking, oh, well, I have to get, you know, for a showing of this film, I have to get so much because I worked so hard. I put so much money into it. And, and, uh, you know, it's like, well, that's, that's neither here nor there. It's only worth what that demand for that movie is. And there's no demand for it. You know, you're not going to get this, this big, you know, big price for it. And um, another thing uh, that people have to realize is that labor goes into a product until it's all the way in the consumer's hands. Am I, am I out of four minutes already? Yep. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, anyway, the only thing I want to, well, last, my, last, my parting word is the thing that Marx got right, probably, is, is that land should be nationalized. I mean, we should all, we should all own the land, and uh, we should all, you know, collectively collect the economic rent from the land instead of paying taxes on income and sales tax. Uh, all of our government funding should be from the rent of the value of the land that people want to use for their exclusive use. All right. All right. Let's thank our speaker again for giving us a lot to keep around here. I'm going to be collecting as usual. Uh, Bob Matter, the reason the government got, why did the government get involved in the economy? was because of what? It screwed up. The capitalists were in the midst of the depression. Same thing in two, one full at a time. Please, one, all right, lady. All right. We ask her all the time to do this. Bob. Bob, matter. What's that? Please. 
about ten times we ask you. All right, I'm going to start again. The reason the government got involved in the economy, not because they were looking for something to do, is because the capitalist system was defunct. And the same thing happened a few years ago. Once again, and, it, and we've been doing it years and years, salvaging the system here that Marx talked about. Now, I don't know where you're coming from, sir, on the surplus value. According to the Department of Labor statistics, if you have an employee, 40% of the day is he earns his wages. The 60% then is the surplus value, the profit that is to be made on that product. Labor creates all wealth. There's no other way to do it. And the worker only gets 40% of the wealth that he creates. And sir, I have never heard of this, that management has been considered a labor a wealth creator is always classified as overhead and expense like raw materials. It is not at all. Now what happened is this CEOs weren't satisfied with 60% and they've been getting more and more of this take. And that's why their their proportion of it, their salaries, have gone up to three, four, five hundred times. The, the same pay of the worker creating the wealth on the shop floor. And this increased social stratification. In addition to this, American workers are working the longest hours on work and excluded from overtime pay. So they're working longer hours for less pay, but where's the wealth going? Into some guy's pocket called the CEO, the company owner. It's not disappearing. It isn't going away. Um, and the thing that I that blows my mind is that you listen to these Republicans in the Congress and they tell you, oh no, don't go after these guys. They're job creators. They're beneficial. They have some unique attributes that you are lacking and they are entitled to this world. This 10,000 times their subsistence necessity. Not limited to the arts or sports. Um, the, um, oh, by the way, yeah, I mentioned another one. I like that you mentioned the 401k. And after you create wealth for these guys, 40 some years, and you get old or something, he says, thank you. I'll see you around sometime. Thank you for making me rich. I don't know, I hope you have a good time, you know. He doesn't provide you even with the retirement. Go get your own. Or go to the government. Yeah, you don't like the government, Bob? Does the CEO of the company care what happens to you? Not at all. Now I'm going to tell you a story about capitalism right this week. I learned about 400 employees of pickers who were getting cheated uh, by this farm out in California. And I found out they supplied their products, their strawberries and berries, to Yoplait <coughs> and Hagen Das. And I wrote the corporations there and I said, you know, you got this supplier there, he's exploiting these people, and you know, you ever heard of the term boycott? Don't you? And they come up with a new term, this is a new term out there, the uh, uh, supplier standard, or something like that, that we only get products from uh, the, the corporations that treat their employees fairly and things like that. But anyhow, the last thing I want to ask, um, I understand that Karl Marx corresponded with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> and <laughs> I was wondering if you knew, and if, if he in fact did, I don't know what they were doing, but apparently old LB was talking yeah. to this old commie, but thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah. Next. You got four minutes. I would like to give Marx credit for the enormous contribution he made uh, to uh, the intellectual um, growth uh, in this area. Matt, uh, you have the basis in sociology where somebody is looking at the economic aspect and the cultural aspect 
and Marx was the first person to do that. It's true that he didn't have the scientific method, but just using his reason, he was able to make an enormous contribution to the intellectual development in sociology and also in economics, that he was looking at the cost of labor and the contribution that was uh, derived therefrom. And again, that's a, uh, that was pioneering during those years. It, um, I would like to give credit to Marx. The gentleman can go down the list of things that, it, that he was uh, in error about, and uh, the list is enormous. But the basis that he contributed uh, was uh, fundamentally uh, a, a, a very important figure in, in intellectual history. Somebody mentioned that uh, the uh, communism or socialism uh, was, uh, was not tried. It's not used today. The Russians tried it after the Russian Revolution. For two years, you had the new economic policy, and it was a complete disaster. You cannot um, base a society on uh, what your needs are and what you're able to contribute. Uh, it's just a, a fallacious uh, idea, and uh, it was destroyed. It's like the Catholic Church was, uh, in the 14th century, was uh, uh, laying down the rules uh, for running a society on, based on Christianity. And that was another disaster. You cannot uh, look at those things. Uh, but the fact that Marx uh, tried uh, is uh, the fact that the communist tribe uh, is um, a tribute to what Marx did. The fact that the labor unions are citing exploitation, it was based on error, yes, that's true. But the mere uh, doctrine of exploitation resulted in the uh, trade union um, um, being viable and uh, attracting workers, and uh, it definitely uh, is, uh, uh, is a great contribution, I think, to uh, the welfare of uh, humanity. Various people have mentioned uh, what's the matter with capitalism, that uh, um, <clears throat> What's the matter with capitalism? And they cite all sorts of things that uh, you have uh, income uh, in, in, uh, not distributed uh, in any fair manner and things like that. We have a political system whereby those things can be remedied, okay? Thank God in this country we have the political system. But the Republicans have managed to buy the press and all media, and these things are never brought out. If they aren't brought out, uh, the public would understand uh, where their true uh, benefits lie, and they would be able to correct it. And uh, it isn't, uh, okay, it isn't part of uh, things growing out of communism uh, or capitalism that create these things, but the public, if they understood where their true benefit was, they could correct them under our system. David, again, a, a great talk, enjoyed it, learned a lot. I'm afraid I'm going to have to watch it on the internet another couple of times already to get the full value out of it. There was a lot of content. Um, I'm just going to pick on a couple points, uh, mostly brought up by uh, uh, during the question and answer regarding Sid's point of labor exploitation for the $150 shoes. Uh, to me, $150 sneakers are not labor exploitation, it is consumer exploitation. Any damn fool who will pay 
uh, $150 for a pair of shoes when you can get equivalent functionality for probably 30 to 50 bucks is allowing themselves to be exploited. The reason we do that is because some marketers create an extensive amount of false value using marketing and advertising of various sorts. And of course, a bunch of that 150 bucks goes to, uh, you know, to the athletes, uh, the Michael Jordans and the others who, who promote these shoots. Regarding the uh, fact, here's where I have a, a serious disagreement with our speaker as far as the value of the CEOs. CEOs now get three to 500 times uh, the average worker, some such thing, when as little as 30 or 40 years ago, it was, you know, 10 or 20 times. In most countries in the world, it's still 10, 20, or 30 times. It is much, much less. And uh, this value, I think, there's this premium that CEOs are paid probably has more to do with manipulation uh, of the political system and particularly the tax system. Back in the days when there was a higher marginal tax rate, they, they, we didn't have these massive inequities and we need to go back to a tax system. This is where I disagree with Bob Matter. Income taxes are really the best way to go, provided you have a good uh, progressive income tax system that taxes uh, individuals, not necessarily corporations, but individuals at, at a higher rate. Uh, one of the things that, however, I will say in favor of the capitalists that, the, that liberals do not take into account is the risk factor. There is always a risk factor in investments. People can invest money and lose all of it. And, and this is, this is uh, figured in uh, to what uh, returns should be. I also disagree with the notion that returns are the same from industry to industry. They're not, I don't think they're the same from industry to industry, and they're not the same from place to place, because the factors that especially having to do with the risk factors are different every country in the world and, and in different uh, industries. Um, labor creates all wealth, so says Charlie. Well, not really. Mother Nature creates a heck of a lot of wealth in a lot of different ways. Now, yes, it may take a little labor. You may have to go pick the apple off the tree, but most of the work is done by Mother Nature. Uh, we could talk about that subject all night. We've got, probably got about a minute left, so I will, I will not go any further with that. Uh, okay, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Chuck Collins. This is getting back to the overpriced CEOs. Uh, Chuck Collins, who is the grandson of Oscar Mayer, the hot dog king, uh, inherited a lot of money and chose to spend his life uh, talking about the uh, inequity, but largely about the inequities in our economic system. He wrote a book called One to Ninety Nine, which I recommend. Uh, and one of the issues that came up is, is uh, are these CEOs and hedge fund managers worth that much? Uh, he talked about a hedge fund manager who earned a billion dollars. I don't know who, who it was anymore. And he said, so is this hedge fund manager who earned a billion dollars uh, worth uh, 50, uh, worth uh, 20,000 nurses or whatever it comes out to? And he said, no, definitely not. He's probably not even worth uh, one nurse. So thank you all. Yes, hi, I agree with what some speakers said. Marx was a groundbreaker, deserves credit for breaking new ground. Um, I thought and I had, we didn't have time to ask this question that he had a theory of economic development that went that, that people or man or society evolved in stages from family groups to tribal groups to the economic organization. And the thing that, I'm just, that I've observed is that maybe in a European context you could see those stages evolving. But actually, they still exist today, and they exist in the same city. Within the same city, you can see family groups, you can see gang groups, you can see neighborhood groups, you can see different levels of organization that have within themselves an, econom an economy. Um, so that, that, you know, I, I think that those different levels still exist side by side. 
and that's how you understand. That makes it easier for me to understand things. Um, there was a new song, and the punchline is, or the chorus is, that was a whole lot to pay to save a dollar today. And the song goes on to say how we would like go to, for example, a discount store to buy a product to save a dollar and then lose the jobs. And it goes on along those lines. And the most interesting thing is when the thing started between China and the US and the outsourcing and everything, I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, the only end I see here is if the Chinese move up the pay scale and we move down the pay scale, and when it all levels out, the jobs will come back and they'll be where we were and the world will be a richer place, on average. And the, um, it's such a peaceful transfer of wealth, such an incredibly peaceful transfer of wealth. And then it takes me back to like the 70s when the uh, OPEC was first organized and raised the price of oil. And it was such a peaceful transfer of wealth. They got like so, so rich without guns being fired. And then when I look at this um, country, in a sense, four wars since the, since the 50s and losing three of them outright, and this is a country that has like half the money in the world, you know, nuclear weapons, da da da, and still chooses to lose the wars. It's like such a peaceful transfer. It's it's a um, oh, and I know the time, but the last thing is um, I, the Soviet Union had fallen, and I was watching Saturday Night Live. And the guy looked into the, they were doing the news reports, and the guy looked into the camera, and he said, who knew that the communism would fail because there was no money in it? <laughs> and I think that hit the nail on the head, too. Thank you. I am here to sound a warning and a little bit of note of hope. First of all, where have you guys been for the last 30 years? All I've been hearing tonight, besides the theory of our speaker, which was a good lecture, all I've heard tonight is the same old, same old from the 1960s. <laughs> the reason why the United States is declining economically is because the rest of the world is starting to catch up and embrace capitalism. Oh. We're starting to forget those hard-learned lessons of hard work, of determination, of low government spending, of things. No, I'm not talking about click your heels three times and say tax cuts. No, I'm talking about real economic reform. In the most recent book by Michael Mendelbaum and Thomas Friedman talk about, and this used to be us, we had for a long time, a good formula for prosperity where we were able to get government investment in, we were able to get our, our industry, and had a nice balance. We've lost that balance. And it's not because of any thing that the greedy capitalists did. It's all of us. Our last recession was based not on some spoofy things, but it was just a fraud. Fraud that perpetrated through the mortgage institutions, through the banks, and yes, through us. We were the ones who took out those no doc, no quick loans on a home, knowing we couldn't afford it. Those bankers knew that we would never afford those loans, and it just became a house of cards and fell. Had we been doing our due diligence in capitalism and actually valuing those assets properly and letting a few people go bankrupt, I think we would have been much better off. Now, let's address two specific issues. Those $100 pair of Nike sneakers, 50% of that goes to the retailer, 30% goes to marketing costs. The company, Nike itself, makes about eight bucks. And as far as the governmental TARP program is concerned, if you took a look at government as the venture capitalist of last resort, 
we actually wound up making money on the program for the government. No, it's not capitalism's fault that we're behind. It's because we, as a society, are getting a little too fat, a little too prosperous, and a little bit too lazy for our own good. We're not educating our kids properly. We're not maintaining our infrastructure. We're not do doing the right things we need to do with our government debt. And we're not educating our kids properly. We used to do this. We're not anymore. And that's the reason why America is declining. Thank you. I unfortunately do not know what the uh, origin of the uh, word communism uh, is. I suspect that it comes uh, from the uh, French uh, commune, uh, and I'm not sure what uh, the historical value of uh, the uh, French commune uh, may be. Uh, perhaps we'll get an explanation from our uh, speaker in his rebuttal. Uh, however, uh, the, the principle of sharing, of ministering to the needs of others, a distributed system uh, based on need and ability, uh, is exampled in uh, in the fifth book of the New Testament, uh, the book of Acts in chapters uh, 2 and 4. And it's simply that the brethren uh, had things in common. They, if anybody was in need, they looked uh, to the community uh, to solve it. And the apostles, uh, the uh, representatives of Jesus, uh, his closest students uh, who had been with him uh, for uh, the length of his ministry, uh, they were the, sort of the supervisors of the community and they heard the, the problems that came up. And there were problems. Uh, they weren't living in utopia. They were living with uh, the poor you have with you always. And uh, they were doing and distributing according to need. And uh, they would sell their houses and what they had to uh, meet uh, the needs of the people around them. That's what the kingdom of God is like. You know, look to people's needs and you see to them. Uh, and when, when you have the kind of social solidarity that love breaks out, when you allow yourself uh, to live for others as well as uh, for uh, yourself and your immediate family, a lot of a lot of problems come up and a lot of problems are met i don't know that uh what proportion of the uh working population of the united states uh, have 401ks uh or are retired for that matter uh, and I suspect that it may be a little lower than was inferred uh, by our speaker's remarks. Uh, so I, I think that uh, that if you're going to look for a, a, a better society, you're going to have to find something a little better than uh, uh, 401ks or uh, as uh, our uh, former president uh, pushing it, um, uh, because that was basically 
uh, the story of the stock market and making more money for Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I give you your speaker. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're up now. Yeah. You got. Take five minutes. Yeah. Okay. David, uh, you got two minutes. No, just just take the time you need. You know what I mean? Oh. Five, ten, fifteen time minutes. Time I need. Uh, no, no, I mean, I mean what, 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 what I mean is uh, <laughs> ten, fifteen minutes tops. You know. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I'll just touch lightly on a few points that have been made. Um, uh, the question of whether communism came from the what was called the French Commune. If you mean the Paris Commune, yeah, no, it couldn't have been the Paris Commune was at the same time as the Chicago Fire, 1871, um, uh, whereas the word communism was in use in the early 1840s. Uh, it was French, though. Com Le communisme was the original, and it, then it became communism in and communism in English. Um, and uh, the, uh, the meaning at that time was, when, it, when communism first became distinguished from socialism, was that socialism was a market system in which buying and selling would be retained but reformed, whereas communism would be a system that abolished buying and selling. Um, so that was the big distinction, and that's why Marx called himself a communist and not a socialist, because he was in favor of the abolition of buying and selling. Um, and he thought that the future society would have to be a society without money and therefore without financial institutions of any kind. Um, <clears throat> Some, somebody said something about capital going to the low-wage parts of the world. Uh, and this is true. Ca I mean, capital goes where costs are lower. Uh, uh, it, what this means is the product prices are lower. It doesn't mean the return to the capitalist is higher. It means the product prices are lower. The, pro the return to the capitalist is going to be the same, uh, regardless of the wage costs. Um, but it's going to be a return on a lower amount, but probably a big per unit, but probably a bigger mass if they can find something that's cheaper. But and of course, the long run result of using low wage labour is that you raise that low wage labour. So what happens now every year is in China and in India is wages are rising quite rapidly with economic growth. It's the same thing that happened in the 1950s and 60s and 70s in in Japan, uh, and it's. There is a tendency for people to talk as though one country's gain is another country's loss. And people talk about the decline of the US. The, de the US is going to decline relatively. After all, why should 5% of the world's population have nearly all the world's resources? Uh, and something like 60 or 70% of the world's military equipment and, and so on. There's no reason that, that, to expect that that's going to continue. Uh, the rest of the world is going to catch up. The rest of the world is going to industrialize. Um, uh, let me say this. I, t I called my talk Good and Bad in Karl Marx, and somebody here might not be quite clear about what I mean by that. Where I think Marx was absolutely right was in being in favor of economic growth. Uh, and he saw that progress, the future of uh, improvement in human living conditions, was dependent upon economic growth, which was dependent upon the development of technology um, and the best use of that technology in production. And I think that, that, that Marx was right about that, which means that the present day left is dead wrong. The present day left is against economic growth. Uh, the people who are now in favor of economic growth, people like me, are on the libertarian right. Uh, and we agree with Marx, and we agree with Trotsky, that nuclear power is a great thing. Because why is it a great thing? Because it brings cheap energy to the masses. Yes. Uh, because it enables the masses of China and India and Africa and South America to advance their living conditions at a rapid rate. That's why I'm in favor of Marx's insistence on the importance of economic growth. Uh, the left today is anti-Marxist, even the ones who call themselves Marxists are anti-Marxists because they're against economic growth and they want to put all kinds of obstacles in the way of economic growth. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about rapid climate change. I was here a few months ago and I thought, I'd, I'd, uh, um, <clears throat> I thought I'd dismiss this nonsense for good. But, um, I, I, pointed, I pointed out at that time that um, 
uh, in nine and a half years, as I said then, there will be no talk about this. Everybody will agree that it was a, a huge blunder. Well, it, that was at least six months ago, so we'll say nine years now. Nine years from now, everybody in this room who's still around is going to agree that this was one of the most ridiculous pieces of nonsense in the history of human thought. This whole idea uh, <clears throat> that there's some kind of danger from burning fossil fuels and raising the world's temperature. And by the way, uh, the average global surface temperature for more than the past 10 years has been stationary. Uh, they, um, some say 15 years or more, uh, but let's say at least 10 years. So there has been no rapid climate change. Um, in, in, uh, in, in, in recent years. Now, some people say that the missing heat is hiding in the ocean, uh, but, that's, but uh, actually empirical research shows that that's nonsense too. So there is no uh, rapid climate change. Um, and um, uh, if I'm still around and still living anywhere near Chicago, nine years from now, I'll come back and cackle and say, I told you so. Uh, <laughs> how could you believe such in idiotic nonsense? I'll fix that. Um, <laughs> okay, now, um, what I think is one of the most important, I, I wanted to talk about Marx, uh, and the question is, what that Marx said is relevant today, and I think one of the things I want to, uh, want to make clear to put this all in a, a better light, is that I think that after Marx's death, the world developed in a way quite contrary to Marx's predictions and Marx's expectations. Now, some things happened just as he expected. That is to say, some parts of the world that were not industrialized became industrialized. So in modern industry and capitalism spread. That much he got right, although a lot of other people were predicting that as well. But still, that's correct. That's happened. But a lot of other things he said uh, did not happen. The working class, the wage working class, continued to grow, as he defined it, but they did not themselves become subjectively a united class. The nuclear physicist and the clergyman and the dentist did not identify with the man who cleaned out public toilets, to quote the Monty Python, um, to quote the Monty Python uh, um, sketch. sketch. Um, the, 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 there were new uh, divisions within the wage workers, engineers, craftsmen, eventually people in the digital industries, uh, don't regard themselves as being the same kind of people as factory workers. Uh, I'm not here making a value judgment, I'm just saying that, that uh, what Marx expected didn't happen. Uh, um, he expected that the class of Arnzik would become the class of Fierzik, and no, nothing like that has happened. Um, uh, and part of that is that Marx and a lot of other people at the time, a lot of liberals who had the same basic outlook as I do, uh, also made this mistake uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, we all, including Marx, underestimated the power of nationalism. Nationalism is a very powerful force, and it's obviously much, much more powerful than international proletarian solidarity, which is, which is basically a joke. Basically a joke. It's never amounted to anything. So, um, Marx was wrong about that. Now, he was wrong about another thing, and this is very important. If you read Volume 1 of Capital, you will notice that it has 33 chapters. Uh, and if, like some people who uh, suffer from some kind of moral weakness, you want to go to the end of the book to find out how it all turns out, and you read chapter 33. You find that chapter 33 is extremely tedious. It's an extremely tediously written chapter, uh, and it's about something that you don't really care about. Uh, and you wonder why that is. Well, the answer is very simple. Because capital was going, the book was going to be distributed in countries where there was a censorship, uh, Marx judged that many of the censors, for the government censors, looking at a book, is this a work of respectable economics or too technical for the masses to understand, or is it a dangerous subversive tract? They would look at the end. So anybody who looked at the end would say, oh, this is really tedious, turgid stuff. There's no danger that this is going to make anybody a revolutionary. So what does this mean? It means, it's very simple, it means that the real concluding chapter of Capital 
of volume one of Capital is chapter 32. Uh, and what does chapter 32 do? It's very eloquent. It's like a brilliant piece of rhetoric, such as I could never uh, aspire to. Uh, it's uh, a beautiful example of Marx's purple prose. It's well worth reading, and it sums up all what Marx considers the really important, important points to emerge from his analysis in the previous 31 chapters. And it lays great stress on this point, that the average size of a business enterprise in relation to the whole economy is going to grow indefinitely. Uh, as Marx puts it with beautiful economy, one capitalist always kills many. Uh, and what he means by that is that competition destroys itself by creating monopoly. So all the time, if Marx was right, we should expect to see a diminishing number of business firms in the economy. We should expect to see uh, the growth of huge monopolies that should be irreversible. Uh, now, nothing like this has happened. What? Nothing like this has happened. There are more firms in the economy today than ever. Um, you can look at some industries and see that one firm has 70 or 80 percent. But that was true in Marx's time. That's nothing new. It was true 100 years before Marx. Uh, if anything, the movement has been in the other direction. More firms, more competition, less monopoly. Um, and this is very, very important. Why is it important? It's important because Marx thought that the organizational task of preparing for a communist society was going to be accomplished by capitalism. You were going to have more and more gigantic organizations. Uh, ultimately, if nothing happened to stop it, he says, it would lead to one gigantic firm owning everything. Uh, so that means, what does that mean? It means that communism doesn't have an administrative problem to solve because it's all been done. We have this huge organization which runs the economy. Well, that is not going to happen. If capitalism lasts for a billion years, it will not happen. I don't think capitalism will last for a billion years, but I don't think that that's going to happen. Uh, if, if capitalism lasted for a billion years, it would not come to an end by what all the firms are amalgamating into one big firm. Why am I so confident? Because, well, I could put this in different ways. In 1937, Ronald Coase published an article called The Nature of the Firm. And he pointed out that to any business owner, there are advantages and disadvantages to buying something from outside or making it yourself. Uh, and this tends to influence Thank the size of firms. So this led to a whole branch of economics dealing with the size of firms and with why it is that we have firms at all. Um, why, why is it we don't have just millions of individual self-employed people? Why do we have corporations? And there's a whole branch of economics that deals with this. And one of the things that, of course, emerges from all this is there are disadvantages to being big as well as advantages. Uh, and there is no universal rule that the bigger firm will always beat the smaller firm. And even if it does for a while, and you have a big firm, the big firms are vulnerable to competition as long as they're not protected by the government. The top is a slippery place. And we've seen this again and again. A big corporation seems to dominate everything. Microsoft. Who could possibly go up against Microsoft? Uh, well, we've seen Apple go up against Microsoft. We've seen Microsoft went up against IBM. Uh, people said, who could possibly go up against IBM? IBM thought that. Well, when people think like that, they're, it's, they're coming to the end of their tenure. Uh, there is nothing in capitalism which leads to bigger and bigger firms, bigger and bigger size of organization. Um, I personally think that in the very long run, looking ahead several hundred years, we will see smaller and smaller firms, we will see more and more self-employed individuals, more and more people working for small partner as part of small partnerships. That's what I predict for hundreds of years ahead. That is the long-term trend of capitalism. I could give my reasons for that if I had the time. Uh, so, but anyway, what we can say is this. What Marx expected has not happened. The workers have not become revolutionary, and capitalism has not united into one big organization. Those are the two things he re relied upon. Those two things didn't happen. So there is not going to be a, a communist revolution, as Marx expected. Uh, 
the revolution in Russia was not a communist revolution, as Marx expected. It had nothing to do, actually, with a communist revolution, as Marx expected. But there is never going to be a communist revolution, as envisioned by Marx. Thank you.